That's a beautiful hymn. I don't know whether many know the story, but a young man was going blind and his fiancée jilted him and he went home and wrote that song. That's the cross that lifted up his head. Well, glad to be here again. Um, not too often someone my age gets to stand in front of people and talk. So I'm privileged. Thank you, Rawdon. Hope you're enjoying being in the water. Must be lovely out there. <laughs> um, but um, he's doing another course in diving. At least this one's got to do with rescuing people. So that's got some point. But I guess he's always rescuing people. Or well, God is anyway, we trust, through him. So thank you, Rawdon. Um, we're going to read uh, from, well, I hope we are, we, am I doing something wrong? I don't think so. Why isn't it coming up, Roger? Uh, ah, we're here. Acts 2, 41 to 47. I think... A uh, pastor took pity on me. Here's a nice, simple passage. See what you can do with it. <laughs> Don't muck it up. Um, those who accepted his message were baptized, and about 3,000 were added to their number that day. Wow. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, and to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. And you'll find out in a minute another couple of thousand were added very soon after that. Well, what do we learn here? You can't take everything out of the book of Acts and say, well, that should happen today. But I think most of what's here, in some form, should happen. There were... Oh, hello. Am I not working? Ah, good. A church of at last least 3,000 people. But we learn from Acts 2 and verse 42, and uh, we're not going to learn much without this. No. Okay. Are you going to have to use it? You do it, okay. Hand up. <laughs> Marvelous, these modern things. Well, they were learners, Individually, that's something you and I do as individuals. They were sharers with others, and they were prayers to God or with God. Learners, we're going to think about learners. A church of learners, a church of sharers, and a church of prayers. That's pretty simple, isn't it? And it's where we're at. But first of all, a church of learners. The apostles had three years of learning to impart about grace. The Jews who were listening to him would know something about what Jesus said, but not much. Even those that, you know, were keen 
Anyway, they wouldn't know much and they would have been following what they thought was the right thing. They kept the commandments. The problem was their motivation. They did it either so that they would get a reward or maybe, well, that was what God asked so they would do it. But that isn't really the right motivation, you know. In Exodus 20, we're told that God spoke all these words. This is the Ten Commandments. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. Got that? That's the most important verse. The next one's come. You shall have no other gods before me. You won't make a graven image. You won't misuse the name of the Lord. You'll remember the Sabbath day. If you'll honor your father and mother, you won't murder, you won't commit adultery, you won't steal, and you won't lie, and you won't covet. Why? Because I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt. Why? Why would they do keep it? Out of gratitude. Lord, you have delivered us. And the Jews continually missed the point. Always got their motivation wrong. And that's why the prophets came, taking them back to the basic message of the Old Testament, which was grace. And they had missed it. And when Jesus came, he took up the message of the prophets, a message of grace, the message of Exodus 20. I am the Lord. And we, because we are delivered, because our sins are forgiven, because we made children of God, out of gratitude, we keep the law of Christ. But they had to learn all that. Took a lot to learn. There were ingrained other motivations. And you ask anybody today, you know, what they what they live by. Oh, I do to others as others would, you know, as I'd had them do to me. Well, you can say to them, who said that? Oh, Jesus said it. And you can then tell them other things that Jesus said about grace and what Jesus did. Anyway, they were learners, and we can all be learners, or we are. Picture me early in the morning going into my office, quiet little place. I sit in my blue leather chair and I have a hot cup of tea and I open my Bible. What am I looking for? I'm learning something. Always I want to learn something. Something that tastes sweet like a sucking a sweet orange. Ah, oh, that's good. That'll do me for today. We go on learning. And so it was the church of learners. And they learned in the court of... Keep going there, Roger. You missed your leave behind me. Keep going, keep going. Okay. Probably in the court of the Gentiles. Well, there were 3,000 of them. Where could they meet? That's about the biggest space there was. But maybe not. Maybe they met in some more groups. I don't know. We don't know. It took some organizing, that's for sure, that we don't read anything about here. But they had to be organized to be taught and to learn from the apostles. 3,000 of them. Keep going. And next one. And they were a church of sharers. Next one. Where? In homes. Some had lost everything since baptism. Keep going, Roger. Thank you. Keep going. 
Some had lost everything through baptism. And they met in homes. That's an artist's idea. When I first saw it, I thought, well, they look as though they've been to Cicerellos. You've got fish and chips in butcher paper. Um, but that wasn't the idea. But it wasn't very flash. They met in homes. And they shared. Because some had lost everything in baptism. And they shared wonderfully. They shared their goods. They sold things and helped those who were poor, who had lost everything. I want to tell you a little bit about myself. Notice the picture of the Como Swimming Club. I have this in, at least this bit in line with the pastor. That was the um, part of the Como Swimming Club, the life-saving part. And that's me at 16 in the gold braid uh, because two of us were in the state team representing WA and life-saving. Lovely woman in the middle there, next, right in the middle. Everyone else called her Possum. Isn't that interesting? <laughs> in light of Possum, who's just died. But everyone called her Possum except us, because she was Mrs. Somebody or other. And that was my first experience of belonging, sharing. I came from a home that wasn't bonded. All kinds of reasons, I won't go into it. But we weren't bonded, and I was looking for somewhere to belong. But I'd been there a while, then I got a state blazer, and I was 16. And I suddenly dawned on me, I don't fit here. They all mostly came from the western suburbs, which you know, Dalkey, Nedland, Claremont. And they were money people. And I wasn't. They never ever made me feel bad, but I felt bad. It was never intentional, but I knew that wasn't my group. And then I went to Christian Endeavour. Someone, someone of you know, Len Ravenscroft, but he invited me to Como Baptist Church Christian Endeavour Society. And I wasn't there one day, one night, and I thought, this is where I belong. These are my people. This is what I'm looking for. I had a struggle for a few months, and eventually came to Christ. Why am I telling you this? Because people everywhere are looking to belong. To belong to a group. To belong to a home. Part of being in that Christian Endeavour Society, I met wholesome Christian people. And homes that were bonded and I was so attracted to that as well and I believe that people are attracted to this church because there's a sense of bonding here maybe we're all at much the same age but it's more than that or maybe the age helps us to bond I don't know but a church which is loving welcoming kind Sharing is a great glue, a great attraction today because the glue is missing in society. And it was a church of prayers. In Acts, and we're going back to Acts again, Acts and verse... Um, chapter, sorry, to have had this ready. Acts 4 and 31, uh, we're told that when they, well, Peter and John got into trouble, and they came back and the people prayed. Not to be kept safe, 
but to be bold. And after they prayed, the place where they were meeting was shaken, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and spoke the word of God boldly. They prayed for boldness, and they got it, and they got a shaken building for good measure. And then when at another time when Peter was in prison, and he got out of prison, and he went to the house of Mary, the mother of John, also called Mark, where many people had gathered and were praying. They met in homes for prayer, as well as at the temple. But I, here I'm going to plug home groups. Keep going, keep going. Home group three, yeah, here we go. Why do we pray? Well, we express our dependence. I want to suggest that instead of worrying, pray. And this is for Philippians 4, 6. Let petitions and praises shape your worries into prayers. Are you a worrier? Better than Valium is prayer. We hand it over to God. In doing so, we are freed from worry. But they do it in home groups. They did it at the temple. They would go to the temple, but then they would come home into these groups and they would pray. Yep, there are the fish and chips. But I want to show you uh, a picture. Next one. Next one, yep. That's next one. 2002. Meeting in our home, Faye and I, with a home group. Five years we met together. In five years in the Bailey home, I don't know whether you remember uh, the Baileys, but then five, next ten years, we've been with the Morrisons. Keep going. There we are. That's last Tuesday. See yourself. We're having Hilda's lovely food. That isn't the only reason we meet, though. But that's good. And next one. Then we study the Bible. Uh, okay. And see there, next one. There's the Bible. We read the Bible. And that's been going for 10 years now. I recommend, as you read this passage, think about that action that you can follow. Get into some small group. doesn't really matter too much how or where, but get into it. And then we're told that they were a church of happy people. Oh, then I find it. Mm. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and single hearts. That's right. A church of happy people. Because they prayed, because they shared, because they were learning. We should be glass half full sort of people. Well, not half full. Psalm 23 says, my cup runs over, but not half empty. We've got everything on our side. Even if the church is declining and some people think we're going into dark ages, I don't think so, but it doesn't matter. Even if we are, we're still cups overflowing people. Because God's on our side. And in Psalm 118, 24, this is the day the Lord has made. I will be glad and rejoice in it. No matter what the day. 
no matter how bad it is. When your feet hit the ground out of bed, this is the day. The Lord has made, I will be glad and rejoice in it. Now, I want to show you something else. We're going back, going. Next one. Next one. Wonders and signs, yes. That's what this is called. Wonders and signs. And I'm going to show you some, but there's the biggest. A church of learners, sharers, and prayers. Next one. Out of that there came, next one, a marvellous miracle. Peter and John going up to the temple. There's a man begging. And Peter says, I haven't got anything to give you, but here, come on. Right hand lifted him up and he was well. What a scene. People gathered all around. And so Peter tells them. He tells them a whole lot of things. And next one. For you. First, God raised up his servant and sent him to bless you by turning each of you from your evil ways. He preaches a marvellous sermon to all these people that have gathered because of the miracle. Next one. And that leads to something else. Peter and John get before the Sanhedrin leaders and they're told, you're the preach no more. You're blaming us for his death. Cut it out. They gave him a night in prison. And then they went home. Next one. And you know what they went home to? 4.32. All the believers were one in heart and mind, no one claimed that any of their possessions was their own and they shared everything they had. With great power, the apostles continued to testify to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus and God's grace was so powerfully at work in them all that there was no needy persons among them. For from time to time, those who owned land or houses sold them and brought the money from the sales and put it at the apostles' feet and it was distributed to everyone who had need. Back to square one. The big miracle. The biggest miracle is there. Not in the healing of the lame man that was. But here's all these people. New lives in Christ, loving one another, learning, sharing. What was the last one? Yep. Learning. Come on, what was the last one? Praying. <laughs> I'm going to read you a prayer. This is my prayer, said Paul to the Philippians, that your love will flourish and that you not only love much, but well. Learn to love appropriately. You need to use your head and test your feelings so that your love is sincere and intelligent, not sentimental gush. Live a lover's life, circumspect and exemplary, a life Jesus will be proud of, bountiful in fruits from the soul, making Jesus Christ attractive to all, getting everyone involved in the glory and praise of God. That's from the message. It doesn't say sentimental gush in most Bibles. But that's what it means. That's our message. I'm not here to tell you you're doing it all wrong. Please hear me. 
I think we're doing it pretty well. Be encouraged. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord, for your word to us this morning. Thank you for its encouragement and its challenge. We offer ourselves to you that you refine, that you touch us, that you open us up. Warm our hearts with your love. Strengthen us by your spirit. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Thank you.